Okay, so I'm Molly Letterman from Washtenaw Community College in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I'm super thrilled to have all of you here for our uh, first mini workshop in the OER um, committee from the CGCLS group. Uh, we have a, a, a series going on this semester called What You Need to Know on Various OER Issues. Today's topic is course marking, and at the end of today's session, I'll share the additional topics and meeting dates and registration links for the rest of those sessions in case you want to register for a few more. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get started. So um, the agenda for today is going to be that we're going to kind of introduce ourselves. I want to see where everyone's from. We can keep this pretty informal. I'll be watching the chat. You can kind of raise your hand if you want to unmute and ask a question. So don't feel like you have to wait till the end. We can make this very conversational. That's our goal um, to bring us all together and talk about things. Um, and what I'll be doing is giving you an overview, kind of the big picture, what's going on around the nation in regards to course marking. Um, and then we'll also discuss some key problems and challenges into getting course marking started on your campus or maybe even getting legislative work done in your state. Um, we'll have plenty of time for discussion. Like I said, chime in anytime you want. And uh, we will be following up with an email with these slides and any other additional resources that are crowdsourced and recommended by you. And uh, the video recording from today's session will be shared, but not until the end. We're going to share all of the recordings from the series as a whole kind of at the end of the semester. So you can watch for that. So I'm curious to know who's here. So go ahead in the chat, share your city and state. And if you have a burning question, a comment, something going on that brought you here today or something you wanna talk about in regards to course marking, we'll talk about a lot of things, but if you have a pressing question, go ahead and share that in the chat too. It's fun, we have people from all over. Fantastic. Hello everyone. Oh, White Bear Lake, you have a Z degree. That's fantastic. Congratulations. That's not easy to do. All right, we'll let folks keep adding. Welcome everyone. And uh, if you do have a burning question and didn't feel like you have enough time or have a question as you go, like we said, feel free to add it as, as we continue. So what is course marking? Let's start with kind of the big picture. Um, course marking is a designation in a course schedule or registration system that allows students to easily find no cost and low cost textbooks. Um, some systems also include a separate kind of OER indication, but not all of them do. And I always like to discuss course marking, one factor of course marking this way. At some institutions, um, if a course has a no-cost textbook, they just list it as having no course materials or no course materials required. And I always like to remind faculty and administrators at my institution that having no course materials is one thing. Having required course materials that the institution is providing to students for free is something else entirely and deserves to be celebrated, right? Especially if you think about potential institutional funding or grant funding that went into making that happen. Faculty time, librarian time, instructional designer time. Um, there's a lot that goes into making free required resources available and course marking is just one way to celebrate that. So, um, so that's just kind of a piece of this bigger picture of course marking. Here's a couple of examples of what course marking could look like. The first is from my own institution. Um, I'll be sharing a couple, we have kind of a, we've had an interesting journey as far as course marking goes. So I'll be sharing a couple of tidbits here and there as what's happened from my own experience. Um, right now, if a student goes to um, look in the course catalog for composition one, English 111, um, you know, we have what, 70, 80 course sections in any given semester. And you can kind of easily see which sections have that free open educational resource textbook and which sections have that regular book cost. So a student can scroll through and find those, um, <clears throat> find those settings. Um, here's another example. Um, this is Oakland University, just down the road, also in Michigan, and they have their course marking in their registration system, and you can see they also have a little icon. I tried to blow it up, but it's still a little bit blurry, but you can see they have a cute little, it's a textbook with a dollar sign and a line through it, if you can't clearly see it. Um, 
And, um, and so that's just another example. I'll also be showing some more examples of, uh, of course marking as well. And I'm taking a look at the questions in the chat. Um, these are all these are all great questions. Um, Ruth, can you jot some of these down? Um, Ruth Slagles, another member of the OER committee, and uh, and so I can kind of come address them as we go. All right. So um, fantastic. Sorry, I just got caught up. So you have such great questions in the comments already. Okay. So why do we want to do course marking? Well, first, obviously just the ethical piece of providing price transparency and helping students find those low cost and no cost course sections. Last semester, I did a survey of all students in, enrolled in OER sections on my campus, which is about 350 course sections per semester. And I found that about 80% of students regularly use the course catalog, the course schedule to find those low cost and no cost um, offerings, uh, courses with low cost and no cost textbooks. And the course marking really helps because if we go back to my uh, the example of the course marking at my institution, if there's 80 sec sections of composition one and we didn't have this course marking in place, in order to find out what the textbook is for this course, the student would have to go into each of the 80 sections, click on class details, click a link that says textbooks and materials, click a link that takes them into the bookstore, and then click another link for their course section. So that's four clicks across 80 sections to see if any of them have a free textbook. And I think that that's a burden that we shouldn't be putting on our students. Um, I hope you all agree. Um, and so not only to, does the course marking help students, but course marking also really helps advisors. And I just yesterday happened to have a conversation with advisor on my campus who told me how she uses those course markings to really help those students who are really struggling financially. And she used the example of if she knows a student who's been recently living in their car um, and trying to get that degree, or a student who's struggling to pay for childcare costs that, so that they can make it to class and get that degree, she is gonna find every way possible to lower those barriers, eliminate those barriers and lower the cost for students. So <clears throat> it's really important to remember too that it's not just helping students, it's also helping advisors and faculty help students. And uh, oh, Brianna asked, do you have any insight on why a student would choose a normal cost section over OER? Um, Brianna, what I found from my institution was that it was when the course section, it was they, they could only take that time. Like if it was two identical course sections at a the same time with the same instructor, right? They would choose the course section that has the free textbook. So usually it's like if that free option just didn't work with their schedule, then they'd opt for the one with the regular textbook. And there's a slim minority of students that just don't care. Um, but for the most part, you're going to see them just finding that. So um, <clears throat> in addition to helping students and advisors and faculty find these textbooks, another piece that you know we don't really talk about as much, but is equally as important is that accurate institutional data. I'm just curious, like let's just do a quick poll. How many of you are tracking OER or no cost or low cost or other things with, through like a painstaking manual process? I know our OER textbook savings for years have been through like a painstaking manual combing through the catalog, emailing faculty, um, takes hours, sometimes over weeks, right? Yep, I see you, Jody, Allison, Alexis, I see all of you. <laughs> it takes, a David, yep, it takes a long time. And course marking can make that process more consistent and more accurate. So once you have those course markings, you're able to more easily work with your institution to pull reports or even just make your own process of gathering data easier. And if you have the data, then you can research impact on student success outcomes. You can make a case for the return on investment that your institution has put into providing those grant, that grant funding or financial institutional funding for faculty so that you can continue programs or ask for more money. But if you don't have clear, consistent data, it, it can be hard to, to make your case. And so, you know, course marking is, is really important there as well. And interestingly, I um, I was having a conversation with um, somebody who's doing some education research recently, and they were talking about how hard it is to accurately conduct research 
um, especially across institutions, if you don't have clear, consistent data, right? So when we think about the field of OER, if we don't have clear data to help us, um, we can't really do the research that we'd like to do to make the case for continuing these efforts. And it's the law. So in 2008, um, the Higher Education Opportunity Act was enacted and it kind of took place and or took effect in 2010. And what the law says is that universities eligible for funding must uh, include the ISBN number and retail price information for all required and recommended textbooks in their um, course schedule that's used for registration. Now, I think a lot of you are probably in a similar place as my institution where it counts if there's a link to the bookstore, right? If, there, if it's in the course schedule and then there's a link to the bookstore and you see the books there. So that qualifies, you know, that's acceptable under the law. But if we think about the spirit of the law, right? The purpose, the intent of the law is to help students more easily find um, uh, low cost, no cost materials, but also to clearly communicate the cost of materials to students. And I think that, you know, four clicks across 80 sections is not a clear communication to students, right? That's why we need those course markings. And um, and actually, I wanted to share this statistic with you in this um, survey I did too. We had 80% of students feel uncertain about the cost of course materials when they're registering for a class, right? And, and over half of them felt that way most of the time. Um, and so this was just, you know, just on my campus, I'm sure a lot of us would have the same response on our campuses as well. All right, so... Um, some states, in addition to the federal law, some states have course marking legislation. Um, I didn't see, do we have any Oregon, Washington, Texas folks here? I'm jealous. I wish, I wish we had some legislation in Michigan. Um, and a couple of examples. So Oregon was the first in the nation. Congrats, Oregon. Um, they enacted their legislation in 2015. And um, interestingly, this is going to come up a lot because um, how people define different things ends up really being really important for course marking. So in Oregon, there was no clear definition of what would qualify as low cost in course marking. A lot of institutions choose that $40 price point, something is under $40 to, to qualify as a low cost course materials. Um, but it, they'd allowed institutions to kind of decide institution by institution, as well as determine um, what qualifies as course materials, right? Is it just, are you just talking textbooks or are you talking additional materials as well? And, um, and, and I think this was really interesting. In 2019, they added additional legislation that required them to also advertise the course marking. So not only have it, they also had to promote it and advertise it to students. And I'll show you a couple of examples in just a few minutes. Um, a couple of years later, Washington enacted legislation that's very cost focused, like we, you know, listing accurate costs in the course schedule and also, you know, making sure to mark OER. And then Texas um, is very OER focused and they created this, this little um, libguide that talks about what's required and like what, it, what are the elements of this legislation? What does it mean? And then what I wanted to share with you is they have this great getting started guide um, that kind of helps them think through the different aspects of the legislation in Texas. But I thought this was really helpful for anybody um, as you're considering talking points and trying to start to get that course marking process into place. Oh, and Maryland has one too. Yay, go Maryland. Um, if you haven't already taken a look at the um, SPARC OER state policy play, playbooks, playbook, I highly, highly recommend. Um, it includes uh, policy language, um, model model language that you can kind of you know copy and paste and adapt examples, um, related information, and it goes state by state with examples. Um, I have referred to this book many, many times. I highly recommend that you sp spend some time taking a look at this one. And I'll share the link in the chat now. But like I said, we will share um, all the links through the slides um, at the end of the session too. Okay, so any questions here? I just wanted to check in about legislation or anything that we've covered so far. All right. 
And Ruth, if there's a question I should come back to at this time, be sure to let me know. All right, so in addition to kind of statewide legislation, then there's some state approaches by state where there's um, committees or working groups or specific guidelines. And um, I wanted to highlight a couple of them. Massachusetts Department of Higher Ed, I'm gonna open theirs right here. You can see there were a lot of community colleges that went in on this work. Um, and one thing I think that they did really well, sorry for the scrolling, is, um, is def really clearly define how things were gonna be um, used with the course marking and the course schedules and under what conditions. And they even have things like um, if a textbook is $100, but it can be used over two semesters, you can't prorate it and count it as a low cost textbook with $50 one semester and $50 a next, the next semester because their price point uh, for low cost was $50. And so I think it's really interesting um, and helpful to see all of the things that they thought through that could go wrong or people might try to get around as far as course marking in their catalog. Um, so I definitely recommend taking a look at this one. It's a really in-depth detailed example of how, how course marking can be implemented. Um, Florida um, has, uh, was, has another great example. Um, they have this nice overview and then in their resources, they have this best practices for campus implementation, which is a really nice example of how to then share out if you are um, doing something as a group or a consortium or multiple institutions, like sharing out, here's how you're gonna put this into practice. So that's worth taking a look at as well. What I really wanna show you are these two books, um, if you aren't already familiar with them. One of them, the state approaches to OER and no cost and low cost schedule designations, has a, a state by state guide of um, how the course marking was implemented, as well as challenges and lessons learned, and links out to additional details. And I think it's really helpful to look at how other states are doing it and how other institutions are doing it, because then you can maybe find an example that's using the same um, student information system that you are or has the same bookstore that you do, or um, has this has a similar in structure in how course marking might be implemented. Because if you have a clear example, it's easier to go to your institution or go to your stakeholders and say, hey, this group did it this way, and that seems like a really easy thing that we could adopt and do at our institution too. So looking through these examples to find a really similar um, version, I think is, is really, really helpful. And then this, um, I highly recommend this type, this book, um, Marking Open and Affordable Courses, Best Practices and Case Studies. This is very in-depth, talks about things at the policy level, possible stakeholders, and I want to highlight a stakeholder of students. I think this is a, um, a group that we don't capitalize on enough in our course marking and OER initiatives. Um, I, my colleague over at uh, Oakland University, I know she's been working a lot with her student government, which is easier at a four-year institution because the students are there over a longer period of time. But, um, but I think even at our two-year institutions, we can capture student examples. And I know through my survey I recently did, and in the past when I've kind of reached out to faculty teaching OER for student stories, I've been able to capture lots of great examples of where um, you know, I had a, there was a student who uh, her glasses broke and she had the same prescription as her boyfriend, but she needed to pay for textbooks. So she couldn't get the new glasses, new glasses. And so they would pass the glasses back and forth between classes, depending on who was going to class to use the glasses. Um, so capturing those student stories is really important because that really speaks to people of like, oh, it's not just this idea of, you know, marking things in the catalog to feel good. It actually has a direct impact on, on a student and, and their success at the college. A couple of other things that I wanted to highlight in this book is um, that they have some ideas about assessment, which I know we always want to think ahead for. And then there's some additional case studies with community colleges. So there's some specific community college specific examples that you can look at um, as to how people implemented course marking. And then I really liked this processes table as well um, because 
it kind of gives you a visual, you know, this kind of project planning. And for me, when I was looking at it, I thought, oh, this is who I would need to talk to in order, you know, in IT to make this happen. This person is in charge of our banner system. I also need to include the registrar, right? You have to think about all the people who might need to be involved and what role they play um, to make sure to get all the pieces into play for um, to make course marking happen. So I think having some kind of a visual map like this to help you get started can be helpful as well. Okay, so of course, some states have legislation that I'm very jealous of, like I said. Other states have these you know, statewide groups that are amazing and have created this implementation processes. But then I know that there's others of you who are like me, where we're on our own at our institution trying to, trying to make this happen. Are any of you trying to make this happen just on an institutional level basis? Any of you out there like me? Hi, Jody. I see you. Yep. Um, I'm sure there's more of us too. Jalen, yep. And um, I'm sure a lot of us, that's why we're here. So um, I'll share with you quickly uh, the story of my college, which I think is pretty interesting and in how it can move and change in unexpected ways. So we actually pretty early on had some pretty great course marking because our faculty textbook form, their textbook adoption form was a house made form that we used to pull information for Banner, right? To, to that would go into the course schedule um, for students. And then also we would send that information to the bookstore so that they would order and stock the books that faculty needed. And because it was a house made form, we were able to add um, OER, yes, no, a drop down that they had to fill in, and then textbook cost, either low cost, which we define as under $40, um, no cost or regular cost textbooks. And um, so then we were able to have that in our course schedule pretty, pretty consistently. You know, sometimes we'd have to do a little faculty communication, faculty training on definitions and things like that, but it was working pretty well. Well, a year or two ago now, we switched from our in-house form to the Barnes & Noble um, Adoptions and Insights portal textbook adoption form, which goes right to the bookstore. And that means um, that we can't customize it, right? And that means that we can't capture that low cost, no cost information anymore. And there wasn't an accurate way to get OER um, information from that textbook form either. And um, for a lot of you, what you may not know is that if you read your bookstore contract, which I highly recommend you all understand how you know some things work with your bookstore contract, the, that textbook form is proprietary information for the bookstore. So they don't have to share it with us. So any information related to textbook adoptions that we want, we have to gather from faculty on our own. So um, our course catalog system, we have Banner, and uh, if that helps. And, and you can see, actually, I can show you, I brought this up. In our class schedule, you can see where we have this little book cost dropdown, and students used to be able to check any or all of these boxes. And now if you click reduced cost, it doesn't come up with any courses um, because we, we are still trying to figure out a way to accurately capture this data from faculty now that it's not on that form. Luckily, because I was on sabbatical as part of my sabbatical project last semester, I um, did a really in-depth go through of our course schedule and catalog and did the you know four clicks across 80 sections and got some pretty accurate data about our um, OER textbooks. And so right now you can search our course catalog for the free OER and that is accurate, but other classes that aren't using an OER textbook but also have no cost materials, they're not being captured in this data. So I'm feeling very hopeful um, and we're having conversations, we're trying to, to solve the problem, but it's, I'm really, it's interesting to find out how one piece of the pie of the puzzle uh, can really make everything unravel. And then if there's been turnover in administration and they weren't on the initial conversations, right? There's a learning process to explain course markings and the pro and, and the procedures and everything like that. So um, it, it is a challenging process, but I think it's totally worthwhile. Um, and Brent says, can your students search for zero textbook call classes? So yes, yes and no. They can search for, yes, they can search for zero textbook 
classes, but the only ones that will come up right now are the courses using OER. So like our, here's a good example, our yoga class doesn't have a textbook, right? And it wouldn't come up under free because there's no textbook or, you know, there's a couple of other, we have a children's literature course that doesn't use a textbook. Um, that course wouldn't come up even though it also has zero textbook costs. So that's that piece that we're trying to fix. I know it's such a bummer. We're, I'm like I said, I'm feeling I'm feeling optimistic, um, but it's 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 tough. I understand where all of you are. And then, Kansas State. I wanted to highlight this is a really clean, clear example of explaining course marking. So if you wanted, if you had a faculty member or administrator that you need to like, this is an example of of what it is and how it's done. I think this is really clean and clear because they say like, you know, what is it? Why are we doing it in very simple language? And then they talk about how courses are marked at their institution. So there's uh, they use little symbols as well, which I think is kind of nice. So the the zero with a cross through to zero text zero cost textbook, and the L is a low cost textbook. And then um, and then this is how it appears in the course schedule. Um, so there's that little book icon with either the zero or the L. So it's a really great example. Um, they even include their scope and their timeline. So what's included in cost materials cost, what's not included. Um, and so I think this is just like a really clean, clear guide or example if you wanted to show here's how course marking could be implemented or how it has been implemented at one college without getting so far into the weeds that that people are confused. Okay, so I mentioned the advertising. Um, here's two examples of how those low cost and no cost um, course sections, course marking are being advertised. And I think it's really smart and it's a really good selling point for administrators and for the college for why course marking is not just good for faculty, it's good for students, it's good for advisors, it's also good for the college because you know, if a student is saving money on textbooks, maybe they'll register for additional credits. Who knows, right? Maybe they might take that additional course or maybe they might choose to get a couple of credits done at your community college versus you know, the four-year institution and might you know, help increase transfer um, students. So you can really, um, I think, use this advertising opportunity with your marketing departments, with your administrators as why um, these course markings are a really good boon for your, for your college because we're all competing for students these days, right? And students are super stressed about the high cost of, of higher ed. So any way that we can advertise that, hey, our college is trying to save you money and we're you know, trying to make it cheaper for you to get that class done and get that degree, um, it's a really nice selling point. Plus it's just helpful to let students know that they can do that too. Okay, so I wanted to double check. Any questions so far before we get into some of the barriers? So um, how to, one question is, how to make sure course marking works as we move from a homegrown bookstore to an outsourced bookstore? Oh, that is such a great question. That is kind of similar to what happened at my institution. And I would say getting communication with the bookstore or get a bookstore committee formed right away so that you can clearly communicate um, what kind of information will the bookstore, bookstore share with us? Are any textbook adoption forms customizable? Like I can tell you with Barnes & Noble, it's not. Sorry, but um, <clears throat> I think, uh, but yeah, getting on those in those communications from the ground up and say, hey, we need to be able to do this. What's going to need to change or what are we going to have to put in place to make this happen? <laughs> Excuse me. Um, Let's see, a couple of other questions that have come through. Um, advice related to navigating faculty pushback. Oh, that's also a really good question. So at my institution, I think when I communicate to faculty, I always stress faculty autonomy, right? Faculty are allowed to choose the textbook that fits best for their course, and they should. And sometimes there's no free textbook alternative, and that's fine. I think we you know, if you just say, you know, here are the options available and some faculty are choosing these no cost sections or no cost textbooks and we need to help students be able to find them. I think um, communicating that clearly that you're not telling them what to do. You're just helping students find, um, understand um, course or textbook pricing in the course schedule. 
And I know that there are some faculty who are, who feel shamed if they have the regular class textbook, but um, I think luckily you have that federal legislation to stand on. You're saying, you know, the spirit of this is to help students more easily navigate textbook costs and asking students to click in across, you know, four clicks across 80 sections is too much to ask a student to tr who needs to be able to find those lower cost textbook sections. And that's another thing you can always say too, like for those students who need to be able to find those lower cost course sections in order to complete, we need to make that process as easy as possible. Um, let's see, a couple other questions. Do you have data on students Oh, we already answered that one. And then how do you get faculty to actually report no cost, low cost course materials? That's it. And if anybody has solved any of these problems, like I'm speaking from my own experience and what I've looked at at other institutions, but please, if any of you have an answer to any of these questions as well, feel free to raise your hand or, or comment in the chat too. So solutions on getting faculty to actually report no cost, low cost course materials. Well, um, one solution that we're looking at at our institution to solve the problem, because it used to be required, right? There was this required form. You had to fill it out to um, list what text, what your textbook was going to be. And those questions were required. You had to choose that OER and cost section. So that's one option. Build it in as a required piece of something that they're already filling out. And because we don't have that um, at this time, um, one other thing that we're looking at is putting those questions into the course selection. So instead of textbook selection, adding that into the, the course selection process. So when faculty are put in um, either they're by their, their self or their department chair, however it's done at your institution, that they put in which the, their course selection, but then they have to also fill in if the course is an OE, using an OER and if it's no cost, low cost, and or regular cost. And I think it's really, that's one of the most important things you can do at your institution is emphasize that tracking OER and tracking textbook costs are two different but equally important things. Because um, once again, it's about the data because there are a lot of textbooks that would qualify for a zero textbook cost degree that aren't using OER, right? That just, um, you know, are using, you know, slides or using other, you know, other materials that aren't that aren't textbook or, or you know, open education materials, right? So um, I think tracking both of those is is really important. Um, and so just tracking one of them isn't enough. Um, let's see, someone says, Randy says, we have Dean's assistance to check with faculty about whether they are using no cost resources, and it doesn't always work. Yeah, a lot of Faculty education, campus education, I think is important. Can you get on a faculty meeting to talk about it? Um, can you get a meeting with deans or having it come from another level? And then sometimes um, a campaign, email campaign. I will. I have trained faculty in the past by saying, hey, I saw you um, are teaching this course again. Last semester, it was an OER. Is it still an OER? Can you make sure it was in the past? Can you make sure to fill, you know, check that box on the textbook adoptions form? Um, so faculty training can uh, take a little bit of time, uh, but it is hard. Any other? Does anybody else have a solution to that? That's such a good one. Making sure that faculty actually report. Any success stories? Oh, that makes me sad. We'll solve this. We can do it. <laughs> Together, together we'll solve this problem. Um, so that's just, that's a good segue into course marking barriers. That's just one example of a barrier. Um, there was a recent survey by the Midwestern Higher Education Compact. Some of you may have filled out the survey where they were looking at course marking across the nation. And these are the key barriers that they identified in that survey. So lack of support, right? Not having either the legislative backing or state level backing like my institution to get it done, right? So we're kind of trying to do it from the ground up from within our institution. Um, definition challenges. I've shared with you a bunch of different examples of how different colleges and campuses have defined that low cost, have defined course materials because that's really the most important first step you can do. Um, if you want faculty to accurately report what they have, they have to understand 
how to report it and whether or not they have a low cost textbook. And then um, with that Massachusetts example, you know, sometimes you have to get into the nitty gritty of like, will this qualify? Will this not qualify? What's the list of, what list of things is considered course materials? And that um, um, Kansas University example was, was really helpful there. Um, so make sure, I think one good place to start is can your campus agree on those definitions in order to get this started? At my campus, I think we're in the technology slash process slash data input phase of challenges. Um, where we have to figure out how to get that information from faculty now that we no longer have that form. Um, and, uh, and, and like we said, it's, it's having a point person for course marking to disseminate information, to make sure that those um, how-tos are, are given to the right people and are easily available, I think is really important um, so that it just doesn't get lost in the wayside and end up being really inconsistent or just maybe end altogether. And then awareness, that awareness piece is, is really important because um, if, if faculty don't know how to do it, they aren't gonna do it. If students don't know that it's there, it's not helpful to them. Or if they don't understand the markings, that's not helpful to them. So making sure to have a good marketing campaign to raise awareness once you get that course marking in place will really, really go a long way. Um, let's see, Ruth says the division secretaries get all the textbooks from faculty so that students know what the textbooks are. Oh, do you know what? That's division secretaries know everything in my experience. And so that could be another avenue, Ruth, where, you know, they get that information and maybe you make some easy way for them to also track whether or not it's an OER and work directly with those secretaries if they're collecting that information. Um, and as far as, you know, getting that course marking started, that might be one place to start. Um, and another thing that, you know what, another thing that we did to just awareness raising, um, not with course marking, but with OER, is I went around and got a copy, every OER textbook that faculty are using that's being used in a class, it's about 50 at our campus. Um, I either got a link to the textbook they're using online or a PDF copy of the one that they've mashed up and made and created and created an online um, digital reserve collection because we get so many students in the library asking for these OER materials or faculty who are skeptical say, well, what are other people doing? I'd like to see some examples. And so now we have this kind of robust collection of OER content that's actually being used in our on our campus. Um, and then it's a, a, a also a really way, easy way to promote our OER program, right? To keep that awareness building. Okay, so um, a couple of key talking points when it comes to course marking. I highly recommend you go through the resources I've shared and find the ones that, that feel like they work the best for you, but definitely those impact stories on how textbooks affect students. And just email faculty and ask for some stories. They'll be able to tell you um, how, um, how course markings benefit students, faculty, and advisors in your institution. The advisors in the institution are often left out of the conversation. So talk about how advisors will use the course marking and how the course markings will make your institution look good because all of our institutions do wanna be doing the best for their students. Definitely talk about that um, Higher Education Opportunity Act, getting into the spirit of that, and then find those key examples that seem to really fit well with your institution or you think would, look, um, would work well with your administrators. And Ruth asked, what digital platform do you use for the digital reserves? So we have, um, I can just, I'll show it to you really quickly, if you don't mind the scrolling. Oh, here, I'll just open a new window. Um, we have uh, Primo Ex Libris. And so I just built it as a digital collection. So once I'm in Primo, I can click collection discovery. And then um, we, we just got it. We just kind of migrated over. So we're still building some collections and we've done some that are used in specific classes. And then we have these OER textbook collection. Um, and so you can scroll through and see um, the different textbooks that are being used in our classes. It, the only downside is that it says book chapter instead of book. We haven't been able to figure out how to make it say book, book instead of book chapter, but it is the whole book. It's not just a chapter of the book. That's a good question. Okay, so I'm going to share, I just wanna share these links 
with you right away. And um, actually, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen for a second and capture those links for you. Um, and then, too, if you have questions, um, any questions or other um, comments, things that are working well at your institution to start. All right, one second. Here are those key resources. Oh, do you know what? It's not sharing them with the links. Hold on a second. I'm just going to share the slides and slide link because that will work. There we go. And let's see. Andy says, California requires public institutions to provide zero textbook cost markings. Our community college system requires granular data. Um, oh, free using OER, free using no textbook. I love that. That's amazing. Um, thank you for sharing that. That's perfect. Yeah, hopefully, I'm sure that will be helpful to a lot of people. Thank you, Andy. Um, Chris says, we have a supportive administration, but I'm the only one with OER in my job description. Oh, Chris, I know that's hard. And I'm currently the OER point person on our campus, and I don't even think I have OER <laughs> in my job description. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Other uh, comments, questions, things that are going, is any is anybody having um, success with course marking on their campus that wants to share? Any success stories? Oh, and Rachel says, um, admin seems to connect the return on investment. Yes, it's it's that is key, right? You have to think about what's going to speak to your audience to do that. Um, I'm going to share really quickly the um, the links to the next um, the upcoming schedule for the next um, sessions for um, our OER. Um, our next series for the upcoming sessions, um, if you would like to register for a couple of more of those topics. Any questions or comments we didn't address? Like I said, I'm, I'm watching the clock. We said this was gonna be a mini workshop and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> um, and Ruth, did I miss any other questions in the chat that came up? No. Nope. Okay, great. Um, well, I hope this session has been helpful to you. Um, if you have any questions or if you have things that you'd like to see the OER committee do in the future, please feel free to reach out and contact us. Um, Michelle says that the whole Washington state has an OER course marking system. Um, oh, oh, but they're mainly inclusive. Oh, but they're mainly, it's not accurate because of inclusive access textbooks. Yeah, those inclusive access ones, that gets hard because the, the, the price isn't um, necessarily listed in the course schedule. All right, well, thank you so much, everyone. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. I hope you will enjoy looking through all of these resources and hopefully um, at a future session, you'll be able to come back and share your uh, course marking success stories. So thank you very much.